Oh, well, welcome again. It's great to see you. It's great to be here together. Uh, Pastor Chris is my name. Um, just again, want to recall, <laughs> good to meet you guys. Uh, just want to remind, um, thank again for the help and the prayers for last week at day camp. Um, just as a few things, I like looking at things from the numbers. So again, Rich kind of mentioned it. We had 40 students about come to camp through the week. Uh, 17 helpers, nine of whom were in that 13 to 19 range. So if you feel like, oh, yeah, tons of helpers, uh, a lot of those were in that junior range, which is excellent. It was really helpful. Um, we only had one short morning of rain, one sprinkle, which is great. The weather was fantastic. And unfortunately, one broken bone on the last day. And I'm pretty sure, <clears throat> and I haven't, I've only been on day camp for six, this is my sixth one. Um, Rich has done a lot more than I have, and there's others who have done a lot more than that. But I'm pretty sure we need to restart our schedule of like, I think we're at like 27 years of day camp with no broken bones. Now we got to go back to one. But that's okay. Um, and that young man, you know, uh, and his family were extremely grateful and gracious. Um, it is a milestone, I suppose. We got to recognize the good and the bad parts. But again, great week up until then for him as well. And so still his mom was saying he'll have good memories of the camp and a good memory to hold on to as well of the I think his first broken bone. Um, but I really appreciate one of the things I've thought about with day camp is the church that Oscoda Baptist has established itself this reputation for caring for students, um, for doing things for youth. And one of the things that I'm most encouraged about, you know, I can go back and forth of saying, oh man, that was a great week of day camp. And then the next week being like, oh, where are my day camp kids? Did, you know, you're all, I just invited you all to come back to church. Anybody here for, you know, from day camp? And okay, it's the regulars, you know. Um, and so I can get a little discouraged sometimes thinking about that. But I'm encouraged by the number of families that make a priority of coming to day camp year to year to year. Um, many of them are not involved in a local church. So I'd love to see that next step taken, right? That next step taken. Um, but I need to remind myself and ourselves, we can't forget that there's this recognized need for God in our community. They know that church is the right place for their kids. They know that um, it's a good thing for them. Awana, they bring their kids to Awana even if they don't come on Sunday mornings and things. And so I just want to encourage us, one of the biggest things that I do day camp for and is to get to know parents. It's to get to know these families. We're ministering to these parents. Um, so let's continue building relationships with them. Encourage those friends who are not yet in church, might feel like outsiders to follow Jesus with us. And today's message does have a lot to do with outsiders and insiders. And so just keep that in mind as we're talking there are a lot of folks who don't feel like this area is their kind of comfort zone, okay? And that's an okay thing. If it is yours, it's one of our jobs is to help others to, to bring them into it. So I do want to pray before we get started. We're going to look in Scripture, and we've got a lot to talk about, so I'm going to jump right in. But just a quick little announcement there first. Uh, let's pray before we get started in Ephesians 2. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness to us that we just sang about, that you are the Lord of creation. Um, you are holy, and yet you have revealed yourself to us. Um, we can know you, and you have brought us close. We're not strangers anymore if we have faith in you, Lord, but you have brought us close, and you have made us part of your family, and what a great thing that is. And we just want to invite others to it as well. We want to praise you for it, and we want to um, recognize you. So I pray that you just speak through these words this morning, Lord. Encourage us to be people who, um, who trust you, who follow you, who encourage others to do so as well. Pray this in your name. Amen. So today's passage, if, and I would encourage you to open to it first, but is Ephesians 2, and it's 11 through 22. I've titled this, Aliens to Unity Through the Work of Christ. And I want to start this morning just asking a hypothetical question. You don't have to raise your hands. But just to think about, has anyone here ever felt like an outsider at church? 
outsider even though you're at church. You know that it's a body of believers, you're, but you kind of, maybe it's a new church, you've been, not been there before, and so you're kind of like, okay, I don't know where I'm supposed to sit yet, I'm not sure if these people are the same as me, so I'm kind of watchful. Um, but maybe just there's two groups and you recognize it and you say, even in your own church, you might be like, I've come here a long time, but I feel like there's this these inside group, this outsider group, dynamics, right? Uh, there's a joke, kind of a sad joke within churches that unity is this really unrealistic goal. We know that we're supposed to be united in Christ and yet people will talk about churches as being places of like, great division within even little churches. Like, oh, those people do this, they do that. We're, we don't really talk to those people. We, we love each other, but we don't necessarily like each other, right? Um, you've heard the joke before. There you go, see? Um, unity is hard, okay? And there is a sad, difficult reality of insider-outsider dynamics. And I was thinking about this with day camp and with people that we invite friends to church and things. Um, there's a, I think, there's a big reason why those who are, a lot of people are interested in Jesus. The fact that they bring their kids. To me, I'm only, I'm only taking my kids to things that I know are important and good, right? I'm not sending my kids to a program that I don't trust, right? I know that the, so the families in our community send their kids to Awana. They send them to day camp. Shows that me that there's an interest in faith in Jesus, knowing that the Bible is a good thing. Um, but there are many, many people, you may know them yourselves, who don't, who are not involved in a local church, right? And they might claim a personal faith still, um, but there's this feeling of not belonging, not belonging to a church. Uh, they feel like outsiders when they go, like, I'm not sure if I can get there. Uh, they may not know the lingo, and there's, there is church lingo, whether we like it or not. We sometimes have these different ways that we talk. Um, maybe the church attendance wasn't a habit they're trained up in. You know, for a lot of us, it was a habit. Sunday morning, you get up, you go to church. A lot of folks, that's not their thing. They weren't used to Sunday school growing up. And so the feeling of being an outsider is stronger than that potential value of being a part of a body of believers. Can anybody think of someone and be like, yeah, you know what, I'm pretty sure that person would come, but just that they're not ready to make that step because that feeling of being an outsider is stronger than that. Yeah, I, I should be part of this. Okay, here's the thing. Jesus cares about the body. He cares for each individual. He continually and consistently urges unity in the church because a unified body reflects him well. And so for those who may feel like outsiders, maybe it's you who feels like an outsider in religious and church circles, and for those, again, who are outside of our church completely, I have good news because God cares for the outsider. That's today's message. He cares for them. He brings aliens and those who are not part of a faith community and a faith culture. He brings them in and does amazing things for them. And we want to appreciate that. So just to recap, and we're going to get into that, but just to recap the last few weeks of Ephesians we've been going through. Okay, We've been looking at God's plan for his people, his church, his church, uh, his people, his body. His plan is to build a people for his glory. That is the point of being a part of a church is we want to be his people that glorify him. That's our goal. That's what his goal for the church is. And so far, we've looked at many different things. The first sermon, if you remember, is these immense blessings that you have by being in Christ. There's this huge list, being redeemed, being elected, being chosen. Okay, That was the blessings we have in Christ. Uh, the next week, we had this encouragement to pray for one another, to pray that we would know and really see God's awesomeness, his work, his position of the glorified reigning king. Okay, uh, we took a little break, and then last week, we talked about the importance of remembering our past condition, right? We talked about sin. It was this kind of downer sermon, <clears throat> but it was this thing we need to remember our past condition of being dead in sin so that we'd really appreciate 
the good news, which is being made alive in Christ. Um, Today's message is a continuation from that previous chapter. So it's not just remembering our dead in sin, but it's got a comparison of bad news to good news. Okay, that one was being dead in sin to being made alive in Christ. This one, and that was, that was a very broad, just as a thought. That was very broad. Everyone was born dead in sin, and everyone can be made alive in Christ by faith in Jesus. Now, this next chapter in this passage we want to read addresses a more specific state that the readers, the Ephesians, uh, were in. I want to think at most... <clears throat> I'm trying to think it through, but I'll get into it. Um, they, their state, as it pertained to being outsiders, okay? Outsiders, aliens, the most negative thing you can think of was talked about with them. And I just want to read it first to get going um, and talk about this position that you might not think of as a terrible thing, but um, is really important. It starts in verse 11, and it says here, remember. Therefore, remember, formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called the uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. I'm going to pause there. So 11 through 12 paints a picture of the Ephesian readers. Okay, um, I was just at camp for the last week, and you hear kids kind of do things to exclude one another, and they use insults somewhat, you know. And I don't think, gratefully, I heard too many insults that kids would use with each other. Um, but I was thinking about it in that way. Like, you know, most, most every insult, whether it doesn't matter what it, they say about it, it's meant to exclude the person, right? You can think about it like, oh, you're such a brainiac. Well, that's a good thing, right? But <laughs> if, they, if the group that's saying it is not the brainiacs, and then they're saying like, oh, you're so smart, that's to exclude them and say that, right? They're different from them. Um, so I can, I'm not, I don't want you guys dig deep too deeply, but what was the most, um, <clears throat> I'm trying to think, the most insulting, excluding Thing. You might have it, it might be stuck in your head still from back when you were a tiny kid. Be like, I remember being called this as a kid, and it still sticks with me, right? Can anybody think of it and it comes to mind? Hopefully not. Okay, the most insulting thing that you could be called, a uh, most exclusionary term that you could think of. Um, this focus, this passage focuses on the most insulting exclusionary term that you could think of at this time. And it might not be one that you're used to. It's the term Gentiles. Who here has been called a Gentile is in a super offensive way? Anybody? No? Okay, that's pretty normal. <laughs> We're in America. I'm pretty sure most, probably the majority of people in America would be Gentiles if we were to count ourselves up, right? What is a Gentile? We've got to kind of look at it to understand and say, why would this be a term or a title that would be offensive or exclusionary or, okay? A Gentile essentially means non what? Non Jewish, yes. Jewish, non Israelite. Okay? Ouch, ouch, that hurts, right? <laughs> you not, I, okay, again, it's not a common insult. It's not a good, because in our day, in our time, that's not a big deal. Most of the people here are not from Jewish descent. Um, However, in the Middle East, in that first century, relations of Jewish Gentile divide. That is a big deal. That's what I want to kind of get started and look at to make sure we understand. Jewish, Gentile, insider, outsider. I want you to think that way. Okay? And it starts looking back. It's not so much of being in sin, but it's that specific state that Gentiles were in. Those people who were born outside of Israel and their status as outsiders and aliens. Okay? This was a real divide then. They could sense it. The recipients were, um, if you were to look at a map, modern-day Turkey, uh, under Roman control. So these guys had heard about Jesus. 
they believed, and they were some of the first non-Jewish converts to Christianity, would be these readers. Most of the first believers, right, the 12 disciples, came from a Jewish background. Most of their first believers were seeing belief in Jesus, understanding Jesus as the fulfillment of Judaism. Now Judaism and Christianity, right, are not, you would not consider them together, right? However, at that time, that was where the first believers came from. But this distinction was there. And there's a reason it's important. So why would this distinction of Jew-Gentile be important? Uh, it might seem like they're on the same playing field. You might be asking, why? What's the difference? They're both separate from God, right? Both people groups. All people are sinners. All people need to believe in Christ to be saved. Um, the difference was that the Jewish people were given a great advantage and many opportunities to live out lives of faith as he prescribed. That's basically what most of the Old Testament is about, is a foundation of faith that he set up for the Jewish people. Okay? Not an exact parallel, but being born Jewish back then would be a little bit like being born into a Christian family, active in a Christian community. Okay? This is not an exact parallel, but think about it. If you're born in a community that taught fundamentals of faith, who made a practice and habit of worshiping, of celebrating Sunday worship, right? Of getting together with a faith community. Um, you might have an insider status, more, res more opportunity, if you will, to respond to God. Okay, the, J the Jewish nation was literally called God's chosen people. And so that inside track, right? That's what God called them to be. He said he was going to make, and this was his goal, a chosen nation, a special people, holy, set apart, and what their goal, the whole point of that Jewish nation that his, he was doing with them, was to show surrounding nations what a God-fearing people looked like so that those other nations could learn and see what God was like. Okay? That was quite the privilege that the Jewish people had. Okay? So I'm going to look at some of the benefits that those Jewish people had that the non-Jewish people, the Gentiles, were lacking. Okay? So it meant benefits for Jews, but it meant things that Gentiles were excluded from. Okay? And this passage talks about it. It says one of the benefits was messianic hope. Okay? A hope for a coming Savior, Messiah, an anointed one that would save his people. It's a beautiful theme that runs through the whole Old Testament, that coming Messiah. Uh, Messiah, just as a thing translated into Greek, would be Christ. So Jesus' last name is not actually Jesus Christ. I mean, but Jesus, that title is Jesus the Messiah. Okay? So, from the first, from the time of the first sin, if you guys put your history books, your Bible stuff back, all the way to Adam and Eve. God punished Adam and Eve for sinning, right? But even then, he is, he provided for them. He established a hope, a foreshadowing of when all sin would be paid for and that the evil that the serpent had introduced to the world would be destroyed, okay? He established from the very first sin a messianic hope. Uh, Genesis 3.15 is where that is. If you want to just take the note, you can look at it later. But it says, when God is speaking to the serpent, okay, he says, from the woman's seed, right? he says, from the woman's seed, a Savior will come, will crush the serpent's head. From the very beginning, God's chosen one. right? You will bite their heel, and he will crush your head. From that person, God will send a Savior that will deal with sin. Sin is not the end of the line for Adam and Eve. It's not the end of the line for humanity. It is this Messiah. He will take care of sin. Okay. Um, that promise would go with the Jewish people through their whole history. Um, David writes about God's anointed one. In Psalm 2, in Isaiah 9, 6, 
some of those verses that the New Testament looks back on. It says, for us, a child is born, a son is given, who will be a king, who will save his people. This king would be anointed by God. He would bring salvation to God's people. This is the hope that the Jewish people were holding on to when Jesus came. Okay? And so they were given that hope. Throughout life, whatever was going on with them, whatever was happening, the Jewish people knew God's anointed one has the final answer. They had that hope in him. A second benefit that Jews had was belonging to the nation of Israel, okay, this special nation. Um, that might not seem like a special thing. We know nowadays even Israel is a special nation. There's something about it that <laughs> there's a reason that like all eyes of the world are on it today even still. But the reason is because God revealed in the Bible, God chose this nation to reveal himself in the ancient times. He didn't, have, he didn't use the Bible like we do now to reveal himself. He was using that specific people. Okay? He called Abraham. If you go into history, he called Abraham and his descendants. He called them to a new land he, to live by faith. This is going to be a faith nation. It's not going to be only based on on the places, but it is based on your faith in him. Okay? His 12 sons would be the fathers and the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay? And he took that loosely connected group of people, that family, and he united them through Moses and giving them the law. Okay? God showed through all of these things that he was creating a unique nation in the Old Testament. And that nation, the job of them was to show the world what the one true God was like. Okay. Can you imagine feeling that, having that as your history? To say, you know what, God, my country, my group. Sometimes we mistake that with America and say, my country, my group is what God is showing the world himself in. That's not the case. That was Israel. Today, it's not one nation specifically. It is a, his whole church. It is his total church. His church in America, his church in Latin America, in South America, in Asia, in Europe. His church, those who believe in him, those are the chosen people that he is using to show himself to the world. But in this time, in the Old Testament, it was one country. That's an amazing thing. And he gave them special things. He gave them the law. Okay? So having that as your history would be a great resource to look back when challenges of life really forced you to trust in God. Okay? So that's the second benefit, belonging to the nation of Israel. Third benefit that the Jews had was the promises and the covenants made to Israel. Uh, we sang about it. I love that song that says, you're the God of promises, faithful, God of covenant, faithful promises. Right? A primary theme throughout the Old Testament is that God chose to reveal himself to humanity through the nation of Israel and through his covenants to them. Okay? To look at his covenants, we need to see, just look a little bit at what a covenant is. Okay? A covenant are these promises that God initiated and they showed his character. Okay? His promises that he would be faithful even when his people fail. Okay? His promises said, I will bless you and your descendants when you follow me, when you obey me. When you disobey, your life will be dis difficult but I will still be faithful. One of the best verses in my, I can't get the reference at the moment, but it says, well, though we <laughs> remain faithless, he is faithful. I mean, so he gave many covenants. There's a few main ones that we can look at, but um, Abraham was the Abrahamic covenant. God promised to make him into a nation. God called him out of his land and said, look, I'm choosing you to be a people of faith, you simply trust me, and I'll do the rest. And I'm going to make you into a great nation. Through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And so Abraham probably thought it just meant, you're going to give me a lot of descendants. We see now, through Abraham, through his line, it wasn't just the nations will be blessed by these many people. It's the nations will be blessed because Jesus comes from that family. Okay? To Moses, he promised him peace in a promised land. Okay? 
if they obeyed his holy law. So God said, look, I'm making this covenant with you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a place. I'm going to give you my law. And if you obey that law, you're going to be blessed. And if you break that law, you're going to have problems. Um, you know, one of the great things about it for us, for our benefit, is that we saw through that one of the main purposes of God giving his holy law to the people of Israel was to show them they could not actually keep it. They couldn't actually keep the law. So he gave it to them and he said, look, you follow it. We're good. I'm going to bless you. I'll bl- I, you're going to have problems when you don't. But look, when God's law, again, the purpose of it is to show us our sinfulness and their need of a Savior. And so they needed a Savior just as we do, but they had that law. At least we got to see, know what God's expectations were for them. Uh, and then to David, this one's called the, the Davidic uh, covenant, God promised a descendant. A descendant of David's would reign on the throne over the people of God. They would have a king that would reign with justice better than any of their previous leaders. And this king would not be one that failed or got cut off or different things. It was an eternal king. Okay? Those are promises, those are promises, covenants that he made to them. And that would be a great advantage if you said, look, you know what? What do I have as a faith base? What do I have to put my faith and trust in? To say, oh wait, we all need sinning, but wow, you know what? This faith community, this, sorry, community, this is a great advantage. I've got so much foundation, proximity to God's revelation. Okay? Faith, by the way, is not something that you can be born into, but that faith background is a great blessing. Okay? Anybody thankful for their grandparents or their parents who instilled in them a faith foundation? Those are important things. Not everybody has that. Some, anybody think, you know, that, that would have been kind of nice. <laughs> I could have, would have appreciated that the first 20, 30 years of my life, 40 years, because when I first came to church, that's the first time I heard this stuff, right? These are some of those things. Again, we're both in the same boat in the sense of needing Christ, desperate without him. But there's a great benefit, a great... Um, to knowing, again, to knowing this messianic hope, to this being born into the nation of Israel, and knowledge of these covenants, the covenant-making, promise-keeping God, which gave them great reason to hope in God. The Jewish people had seen God do amazing things for them, and so it makes sense for them to trust God with their lives. But we're not talking about Jewish people today, are we, right? We're talking about Gentiles. So Gentiles, on the other hand, did not have this benefit. They had a real separation, not being Jews. So again, all those things we just talked about, those benefits for the Jewish people, it says, remember, verse 12, at that time you were separate from Christ, from the Messiah, from that messianic hope. Separate from Messiah, excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Okay? Unaware of those covenants. Those covenants didn't apply to those, to Gentiles, right? And so what was the result of that? Jews had this benefit of knowing all these things. Gentiles were without hope and without God in the world. It was an outsider to the many degrees, okay? Not only were they dead in sin, like we talked about, but their proximity to the God of Israel, the true God, they were distant, they might have seen those spiritual, religious Jewish people and said, that looks pretty, pretty amazing, but they're outside of that. And so that insider outsider, can you kind of imagine, does it doesn't make sense that there might be some hostility with those groups as a result of those different positions? One, chosen people of God. The other group, excluded from the promises of God. Um, that's a pretty good recipe for conflict. And what was there? That was a natural thing that existed. So thankfully, thankfully, we always get good news. Those who are outside in regard to being part of God's plan are now 
completely included in it. Outsiders are included because of what Jesus does. Okay, the next section I title the turning point of meeting Jesus. Okay, we just had benefits for the Jews and exclusion for the Gentiles. Next is just turning point. This next passage, 13 through 18, is, again, an amazing, grateful turning point where Jesus comes in. Remember we were talking about just like those passages to say, but Jesus, okay? Jesus does something, you got to pay attention. And so verse 13 says it. <clears throat> but now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, that verse should just stick with us. Uh, it's, uh, it should be obvious, but sort of anytime someone encounters Jesus, it should be a turning point in your life. Okay? In Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. When we encounter Jesus, there should be a turning point. If not, it should either be a, you know what, that's awesome, but I'm turning, I'm not going to take it. It's too much for me. Or it's life transforming. Um, so I don't want to be critical of anybody today, but I thought about it. I need to think about this. If you consider yourself a Christian, if you have encountered Jesus, if your testimony doesn't include a turning point, okay, a turning point, you know what I'm saying? Like you're going one direction and you encounter Jesus and that, you know, that turns you into a different direction. That makes it a big difference. There's a point of, hold on a second, something changed when I encountered Jesus. If your testimony does not include that, we may need to do some self-evaluation. Does this make sense? I don't want to criticize anybody to just be like, hey, I like Jesus. I've always been good with him, and we're always in a good state, and my life has just been like, I've always believed. You might be in that state of the Jewish people who had all these promises, had this foundation, but still needed to trust Christ for salvation. Okay? When Jesus' path and our path really intersects, there's going to be a big change. And so that's what they talk about. That's for us to think about, but this, the picture is drawn here. These two groups, one was right, the more privileged, having the title of God's chosen people. The other one, more the outsider, thinking that they don't have a part in God's plan Something happens to them. Okay? I'm going to keep reading. <clears throat> They've been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 14 continues it. It says, For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Hey, this section is really just a lot of what Jesus did. Hey, there's a ton. I would love to break it down, um, but honestly, I don't have enough time. And so that would be worthwhile to do and to break down each of these. But there, I broke it down just little bits of these verses of a, I mean, I don't know if it's a Jesus to-do list, but to point out that this insider-outsider divide was a real problem and it was pretty boldly um, addressed in Jesus' actions. The insider-outsider conflict is a secondary conflict. Okay? It's not the most important thing that's going on. Their biggest conflict, right, was their separation from Christ, separation from God. But it's amazing to see how God, by bringing people to him, he destroys these other insider-outsider conflicts. Okay? So... Let's just look at some of the things that he did in his reconciliation of people to himself. Because that reconciliation to himself also reconciles people to one another. Okay? It says he brought 
aliens, those who are far off, near by the blood of Christ. You see that in verse 13? You who were once far away have been brought near. Okay? Verse 14 says, He himself is our peace. He made two groups one. Destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. Okay? Verse 15, He set aside the law with its command and regulations in his flesh. That one does need a little explanation because you might say, oh, the law, all that really important things of God's law that showed his holiness that people are supposed to obey. Uh, you might say, set aside. Well, he just kind of like dismissed it. No. Another word that we should probably use is he fulfilled the law with its commands and regulations because the important passage, the quote there, in his flesh. What was in his flesh? How did he set aside the law? By dying, he took the penalty of the broken law in his self by fulfilling the law. That's why the law, the commands and regulations, was no longer how we gain righteousness by trying to obey it. It's through following Christ. That's how we can be made holy. Okay, the next thing he did, <clears throat> right, creating a new humanity out of the two, making peace. 15, the second half of 15. And then in that one body, his own, reconciling both to God through the cross. Okay, reconciling both. It's not a, there's no first degree and second degree and third place believers. Both through the cross is the only way we can be reconciled. And as a result, their hostility towards one another is put to death. There's no need for hostility with the insiders, the Gentiles to Jews anymore, right? Because Jesus Christ reconciled both to God. Um, <clears throat> and then verse 17, he came and preached peace for both the near and the far off. A lot of people think because the Jewish people were who he first came and they rejected him that they were no longer, right? They are like the first people to reject Jesus, so they're like, more out of the picture now. Unfortunately, they, for the most part, has gone, but he came and preached peace to both the Jews who were near at the time and Gentiles who were far off at the time. That message is for anyone, everyone. Okay, whether you're religious, whether you're not religious. <clears throat> and then the most important, as I see it, verse 18 gave access to the Father by one Spirit. Okay? They, all these things Jesus did, they have this consequence of reconciliation. The most important one is between people and God himself. And yet the beauty of it is that it also spreads. That makes his followers, Jesus' followers, are people who are reconciled to others. That is a huge thing for us. We can be agents of reconciliation because of what Jesus has done for us. <clears throat> okay, so the consequence here is a united people, right? It wasn't to make Gentiles more like the nation of Israel. It was to create an entirely new group, a group of people for his glory, right? God's people for his glory, the whole book theme, are to be united in Christ, Okay. Again, whether you are, I want to keep pressing it, whether you're one of these insiders who attended church from the day you were born and you expected it and always felt near to God, you needed Christ to save you. Praise God that he did. Whether you're, maybe you're on the outside, you know, one of those that does not have much understanding of God of the Bible, you didn't have that upbringing of the law and the prophets, not really comfortable with church culture, you know that you need Jesus you recognize that you need him to save you from sin, and when you put your faith in him, you are brought near. It's not you're brought near into a church culture. You are brought near to Christ. Okay, That is the most important thing to be brought into. And then that insider-outsider hostility makes no sense anymore <clears throat> for anyone who has trusted Christ. He makes one people from the two. Um, his death reconciled them both to him, and they put him on his family. And so that new identity <clears throat> is not whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. It's the identity of being 
God's child. That's what the identity that we want to look for. Okay, so after that turning point, the turning point of meeting Jesus, there are big changes for this new group of people um, made from a formerly different groups of people. Okay, and so the verses 19 and 22 talk a little bit about the ramifications for this new group of people. I want to read that. For believers, I want to read verses 19 through 22. Talking to those Gentiles, but to both really. Consequently, it says, You are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. What an amazing picture of a new identity for people. Okay, It starts, right, those of you who were Gentiles and called uncircumcised by these other people who are called the circumcision, right, by Jews. All that identity, right, of Jew, Gentile, insider, outsider, they're given a new identity. It's not foreigners, strangers, insiders, outsiders. It's fellow citizens with God's people. Not citizens of Israel, which was, you know, again, was pretty cool. Good blessings there. But a new nation, not based on nationality, based on God's work of redemption. Okay? This is their new identity The next piece, part of their identity, members of God's household. Do you see that? It says, fellow citizens with God, members of his household. Think of that contract from the beginning of the passage, right? Strangers being made welcomed as family. Thirdly, built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. What a difference that it makes from foreigners, strangers. And this progression, did you notice it? To being united as one holy temple. I thought this was interesting, those three identities, right? What is it? Um, Excuse me. Fellow citizens with God's people, members of his household, and then a dwelling place where God lives by his spirit. Did you notice those three things, the progressively more intimate they become, you went from just non-members, outsiders, foreigners. And then he says, no, 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 you're actually part of this country, citizens. You're part of my people. No, no, you're not just part of my people. You're part of my household. No, you, you know what? Not even just part of my household. We are fully communion, right? A dwelling place where God himself lives. I think it's really, I think it's purposeful, not just, you know, a literary thing, that it's meant to be that way. It might take us some time to recognize that, to say, oh, wait, we can actually be part of God's family? Sometimes it takes us some time, right? You say, you know what, I trust God for my salvation, but I'm going to stay on the outside of the, of the church. I'm not really a full belief. I'm not part of the group yet. No, once you've put your faith in Christ, you have full, complete access to him. He lives in you. That's what it's saying. Um, and so I think this is an amazing, um, a holy dwelling where God lives by his spirit. That is an amazing identity. That's an amazing thing that we can um, strive to be as a church family. He's the one doing the work to build us into that dwelling where he himself lives. Um, <clears throat> the foundation, again, it says that this dwelling is built on the apostles and prophets. So again, it doesn't throw away the rest of the Bible. The apostles, the prophets, everything that was taught about God's holiness in the Old Testament remains true. Okay? But it's not... um, Excuse me. But the foundation, the basic, the thing that runs through the whole thing is Jesus. He's the one who creates this family and this beautiful unity that's built afterwards. So... We're being built together to become a dwelling where God lives by his spirits. We are being built, and there's a lot of we in that. 
This is one thing I wanted to notice and just say, hold on a second. We are being built. We are being built into a family, a nation, a dwelling place, right? A holy temple. The whole building is joined together. All of you are being built together to become a dwelling which God lives in his spirit. This is a joint effort. A lot of us view our faith and view our Christian walk as a personalized individual thing, right? I invited Jesus into my heart, and to, to a degree that's true, my heart. But it, the communal building of believers is where God does dwell. He dwells in each of us individually with his Holy Spirit, but it is a goal for it to be together. We can't forget that. We can't ever let those thoughts of separate groups and things like that divide when Jesus has put it in together as one thing. Um, again, just to summarize, what's amazing is it starts with two groups that are separated from each other. We realize that the real problem is that these two groups aren't separated from each other. That's not the big issue. Their separation from Jesus is the big issue. He brings them near to God, and because of that, then they grow together. These divisions that we have don't mean anything because Jesus is building a new people. Okay? Being in Christ is what matters. If you're not there yet today, I invite you to let him, let his gift of salvation apply to you. Believe and receive. That's all that matters. Um, and let's be a people who are united in our belonging of Jesus, regardless of where we were previously. That's what I want to pray for us today. And would you join me as I close this in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you so much that you are, um, you're not concerned about uh, those who are inside or outsiders, um, foreigners or regulars, Lord. Your concern is with people who know you, who trust you. You have sent Jesus for the entire world, Lord, and it's our responsibility to just to accept that, to receive you. And once we do, Lord, that we become your people. Um, pray that you would continue building your church, your people. Help us to do that by sharing the good news that you have done for us with one another, inviting others to know you. It's not so much about a church relationship. It's not about a church um, attendance and things like that. Those are great, but it's about knowing you, Lord. Help us to trust you, to know you, and to share you with others. I pray this in your name. Amen.